Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Gail Fugit. Well, welcome back, everyone. Wow. <laughs> With music. Uh, delighted to introduce David Poltrak to all of you who probably needs no introduction. Uh, he's a board member of the ARF. He's uh, currently secretary of the ARF uh, board, and he's going to be transitioning to be our new board chair starting in June. And I'll have uh, probably not this large a public uh, place to be able to thank Colleen Fahey Rush for her service as the board chair of the ARF. She's just been amazing, and I can honestly say that I could have never uh, been able to lead the way that I've been able to in this past year without her support, guidance, and the leadership that she has brought to the ARF as well. Um, so I'd like to, you to give Colleen a round of applause before I... And now it's my great honor to introduce uh, David Poltrak, who exemplifies all of the leadership characteristics that Lori Hills spoke of. He's a chief research officer at CBS Corporation, and he's the president of CBS Vision. Uh, he has the ear of his executive wing of his CEO. When you see change happening in television, David is usually either leading it or he's behind it. Uh, he des designed and oversees the CBS television city and at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. I had the great honor of visiting there when I was at CES in January. And when I showed up, I said, I'm here. They're kind of like, hi, who are you? And then I was like, I'm here to see David Poltrak. And I'll tell you, there he's got a team there that is honoring his vision. And it's amazing uh, the kind of technology that they have in place. If you have a chance to visit, I would highly encourage it. He's an adjunct professor at NYU Stern School of Business and the Steinhardt School of Education. And uh, what really what I want you all to know about David is, uh, if you haven't already figured it out, is he's kind of the E.F. Hutton of our industry, right? When David talks, people listen. And what I love about the work he's doing is that he is actually bringing new technology in terms of behavioral data and, and looking at working with advertisers and connecting buy and watch with behavioral uh, information. And he's helping galvanize uh, new ways of bringing together the different constituents of the ARF. And uh, so without further ado, I want to thank David for bringing together Nielsen, CBS, and the Kellogg Company. These are the kind of presentations that we want to offer you where we bring together uh, buyers, sellers, and uh, advertisers, um, and networks so that they can share with you how they collaborated together to bring about some great work. So please join me in welcoming David. Thank you, Gail. Uh, good afternoon. I want you to know that that promo you just saw was blatant promotional hype and has absolutely nothing to do with our presentation. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, I figured when uh, AOL and Rubicon Project had video, I better get video too. So, uh, so good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the CBS Vision Platinum Learning Session. Uh, we're very excited about the presentation that you are about to see because we believe it will begin the process of correcting a practice that has resulted in the undervaluing of the contribution of advertising to the bottom line. That is the failure to properly account for the long-term brand equity building power of a continuous program of television advertising. Uh, my co-presenters today are going to be uh, Jeff Dow, the director of Marketplace Analytics for Kellogg Company, and Leslie Wood, the chief research office for, Nina, uh, for Nielsen Catalina Solutions. The last major study of the relative profit uh, contribution of advertising and promotion was done almost a quarter of a century ago. Since that time, the marketing evaluation process and marketing mix models have focused on the short term. Mike Hansen's, one of the pioneers in marketing mix modeling, acknowledged in 2011 that, quote, Measurement and, and, and analysis that considers only short-term impact may put advertising 
at an unrealistic disadvantage when allocating marketing resources to maximize long-term profitability. When addressing the long-term effect of advertising, the industry has been content to fall back on the 1991 How Advertising Works study, which actually was based on tests done in the mid-1980s. This study found that if an advertising test was successful in year one, there would continue to be long-term effects of the advertising which, over the course of the next two years, would amount to a full doubling of the first year impact. I was fortunate enough to be a member of the team that funded uh, that study, and I continued to be amazed uh, about how the advertising industry has continued to be comfortable using the multiplier of two times the short-term impact to estimate the long-term impact of their advertising campaigns. After all, this part of the study was based on the results for just 44 CPG brands, and the television landscape has changed a bit since the 1980s. More significantly, we now have far better measurement tools to measure that long-term impact. So I stand before you today asking, is two times the right number? Does the multiplier vary significantly by category and campaign? And can marketing, can marketers effectively maximize the long-term effect by advertising management practices? We set out to answer these questions for a sample of brands. Our assumption was that the real measures available to us today provide us with insight into what drives long-term returns. That the insights gained from this research will, draw, will drive better decisions. That better decisions drive higher effects. Second here. Yep, went too far. Sorry. That better decisions drive higher effects, and that the real measures will provide insights that will lead to a more informed budget setting process. We have found what, what we found was even more definitive than we expected. I will now turn the podium over to Leslie Wood the architect of this groundbreaking research project to take you through the findings along with Jeff Dowd of Kellogg's, our important collaborator on this project. Thank you, Dave. So I'm gonna be talking about the methodology we use to create, the, to do this study. Um, foundationally, it's built on the work of how advertising works from 1991. We started off by looking at what variable was dis truly discriminating in across at long-term effects. So here's an, an example to explain this. We, we, we identified the measure we call trial and depth of repeat. So first we start and we identify trial. How, what, is this the first time you've bought the brand in an X period of time? For this study, we use six months Commonly, it would be a year, but we said in six months if you hadn't bought the brand. For something like Special K, most people have tasted the brand, so we're not talking about true trial, we're talking about lapsed buyers, you know, or lapsed tasters. Um, so we have a warm-up period, you can see on the left, and the first time you buy the brand, it's a trial. The second part is to say, what's the depth of repeat? And by that's the number of consecutive times the brand was bought. So the next time the brand is bought, right after trial, it gets a two. We've gone from trial to two. 
Then they didn't buy the brand when they bought the category, so it reverts to zero. Next time it's a one, next time it's a two, zero, one. And you can, but then you can see over on the left, we count up till six. Now what happened is you get to see that some consumers buy this brand 142 times, you know, in the course of the next two years. So we, we capped the maximum count at six and call it six plus. So that's a foundational piece to understand, is that we're counting trial and depth of repeat. We then take this trial and depth of repeat, and that's what we're doing. We're, we take every single purchase in our data, and we define it as trial and depth of repeat. We're able to look at the future long-term effect because we go back in time. We have two plus years, two and a quarter years of data. So the first six months give us warm up. The next six to eight weeks give us a short term effects. And then we're able to look out into the future and say, what was the long term effect of this short term advertising? We're looking at actual sales. So it's not a model. It's actually measuring what were the sales going out in the future. So what are the steps? First, identify and tag each purchase. It tri by trial and depth of repeat. For each purchase, we then time align that to call it week one, okay? So we take all our purchases, time align them to week one, and then look at what were those households at each trial and depth of repeat doing out in the future weeks. And you'll notice that there's a dip in week two. Well, that's because everybody bought week one. Not everybody's gonna buy week two some, you know, even if your purchase cycle was on average two weeks, there's some that are gonna wait. But so you get, you get this pattern of a drop off and then they come back in. And you see that the difference, green is trial, all, all the way from light blue to dark blue, dark blue is, is, is deep depth. It's really the distance, the area of that space that gives us the long-term effect. So the green, is the difference between a buyer not being a buyer and having tried, that's their value out into the future. The dark blue at the top, that's the difference from being a purchaser at a level five and a purchaser at a level six. So it's not the full value, it's you've, the short term turned somebody from a five into a six or turned somebody in a trial, and this is looking at what are the effects out into the future. This is virtually the same methodology that was undertaken um, by Lodish and how advertising works. Um, he did matched markets. We're doing matched households. So very, very similar technique. We, we didn't, he didn't control for advertising going out into the future, and we haven't either. This is really more a measure of the value of capturing a purchase. It's not actually saying, did advertising a year later influence somebody to buy? It's that the advertising influenced the purchase and that and what's the value of having that purchase been made? So we're gonna introduce um, Jeff and he's gonna take over and take you through the example of Kellogg's Special K. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> so we analyze Special K. This first slide shows the lift from the exposed households to the non-exposed households for Special K TV advertising in the short term. Here you can see Special K is showing lifts across all segments, with some of the higher lifts coming among brand loyals. Now when we look at dollar returns, we can see that the less loyal segments are generating some of the highest dollar returns. And that's simply due to the size of the segments or the number of households that are in those segments. We can also see that Special K is generating lifts across all segments and that they're generating more than their fair share of lifts compared to category dollars for some of the heavier brand loyal segments. Now when you stack all the individual segments, you have the short term effect. So now looking at the long term, the first, the bar or the first week represents the short term effect and the future weeks represent the long term effects. Where you see the 
the largest gap or delta between the segment lines is where we're seeing the long-term gains for the advertising. And in this case, it's for switchers and heavy brand loyals. Now this chart basically shows the same chart as the last one, but shows better visually and in color the drop off in week two that Leslie had talked about doing to purchase cycle or pantry loading, and also better shows the gain that we're seeing in the long term among switchers and heavy brand loyals where the gap is the largest. Now to get to the long-term multiplier, it's basically the difference between the long-term effect and the short-term effect, using the long, uh, short-term effect as, as a denominator to calculate a multiplier across each of the different segments. Here again, we can see that the switchers and the heavy brand loyals are higher than average, and that the average long-term multiplier is 2.5. With that, I'd like to turn it back over to Leslie, who's going to take you through the rest of the brands. So we, we decided we, we needed more brands. We had Special K, but let's look at four more brands. Um, these are brands that we picked, that I specifically picked for this project. They're brands, I picked two that I felt would have very high loyalty and might have high long-term effects. And I picked two that I thought would have, would have um, one with a lot of deal and one with where I felt there was a lot of competition with a direct competitor. So this, this is a soft drink. This is brand B. It's a soft drink. Think, you know, you've got two competitors. This is one of them. Um, Trial is extremely valuable, and so is the moving people from five and six plus. You can see the short-term value is creating a lot of value over on the left. And what do we see going out that there's, there's quite a bit of value? Short little drop in week two, not tremendous. When we look at the multipliers, we see that the value of turning somebody on to being heavily loyal, extremely valuable in the long term for this, this brand. Averages to 3.5, that's by taking the pieces of short term and what does it contribute. This next soft drink brand, also soft drinks have incredible loyalty. This one is a little different in that it, 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 it's a distinct flavor. So you notice short term drove almost no trial. Advertising, it's either you like this flavor or you don't. The chances of driving trial are you know, you're going to like a flavor or you're not going to like a flavor. But if you do turn somebody on short term, you see that they, it derives an awful lot of value going forward. Not huge driving to the 6 plus, but a large band at 6 plus. So let's see what the multipliers look like there. You can see that short term being so small in the long term because it's a numerator denominator situation, huge value for everybody you can get to try this brand, but there weren't that many, so huge value, averaging to a 2.6. We then go to box prepared um, dinners. So um, extremely heavily dealt cat uh, category and brand. And there's an awful lot of choices about what you might use to make dinner. I mean, you don't have to use a box prepared dinner. There's many choices. You can make a, make a dinner from scratch. There's lots of choices. So what we see is getting trial is, is, is pretty good on the short term. Um, moving people up to the, up to the six plus, less, less, less uh, the short term's not working that hard. And when we look at what's the long term value, very, very small very small value going out. And sure enough, when we look at the long-term value, we see on average a one. Um, very little depth of, uh, depth of purchase, but that's because there's, the, you know, the likelihood of every time you're gonna buy this category that you're only gonna make that one choice. You know, when you think sodas, you, you think, you know, there are people who would never buy the competitive brand. They'd rather buy a store brand than that brand. That's not true here at all. 
Um, so we go to the last brand. This is a toothpaste. Um, toothpastes are, there's a small, short list of brands that are highly competitive with each other. And I think they're, they're also dealt heavily against each other. And we see here that you, short-term advertising works quite well, but there's very little long-term. We also see it takes quite a while to, to build up from that, that um, from the dip in the beginning. And of course, that's because the purchase cycle is much longer. It takes a while to get back to normal levels of buying where every week the full um, complement of households are buying. And when we look at this, we see on t in total a 0.8. So trial is extremely um, valuable, and driving that long-term, people who will consistently buy the brand is also extremely important. So if we take these five brands and we say, well, how does that fit against what the industry has been using? This is the graph. It's 1991, so it's a, you know, it's a SAS plot. But um, what you can't really see is this is minus uh, 6, 0, and plus 10. So there's one brand up around 9. There's a whole bunch, a, a handful, 5 or 6, in the 4 to 6 range. The rest are pretty much 0 to 1. There's a few negatives, OK? So this is, we, we say 2 as a multiplier. But in fact, what you see is it's not all two. I, I can't tell you that the numbers we've produced are dramatically higher or out of this range. They're all within this range. Um, and this is the f year, the f year two. Year three is, goes from a, a, a 1.0 down to a, um, a minus six or f at the bottom. But you can see this is a much narrow, the, 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 the axis is much broader. In fact, it's a very narrow band, close to zero or one. So having looked at that, think about putting, putting all of the, the, the values together. So we, are measuring, we were measuring the long-term multiplier. That's if I take short-term, I multiply the short-term times a multiplier, I get the, the, the long term. The long term plus the short term gives me the total value. OK? So how advertising works said 1 plus 1 times 1 is, gives you 2. It's catalog special K, for every piece of short term value, they get 3 and a half. Um, you, you look at the other four brands. So we're coming in slightly higher with a 2 for the smallest brands, 3.6, 3.5, 4.5, slightly higher, but all also within the same realm. So how would you use this if you were actually, if you had your short-term number? And that's what we've shown at the bottom, short-term of 1.2, if the multipliers are 1 1.5, 1 point, this is some other brand, you know. 1.5 times 1.2 gives you your long term of 1.8. Add back the short term, and you end up with a 3. So this is how the math works. And um, this is the, the, the values we found. And so the conclusions. First of all, we were able to do this. We have data. Our data goes back far enough to look forward. Um, uh, you know, it's a remarkable thing. We love the idea that advertisers can actually understand the difference between the different brands in their arsenal of brands. You know, every advertiser often has a handful of brands. Which ones respond in what way? We'd love to know what, it, how, what, why do they vary? It's great to know that they vary, but then what makes them vary? Um, so we believe that the value may be higher than previously believed. We have to do a lot more studies before we actually know that. Um, so what's on our roadmap? We, we need to do lots more brands. We need to understand, is it a brand phenomenon? Does it matter which kind of advertising? You know, Did you have advertising against triers or repeaters? What kind of advertising? What kind of creative? Um, does it vary by what media was used? 
all those kinds of questions. Um, is deal the big driver for long term? And how do you build long term? So the, the key focus we're going to be on, we also believe that we should be in um, uh, other, other verticals. So NCS is a CPG vertical, but Nielsen has other verticals, and we're taking this out to other verticals as well with NBI. So um, how do we get more, more brands measured? I get to call on Dave to our rescue. So I hope you can see why we're excited by this research. It's been a long time that the industry has, I believe, undervalued the value of advertising. And with more and more accountability being called for from the C-suite, it's important that we get in front of our management uh, the true value of the power of advertising. And we now have the analytics and the databases to do that and to do it on a brand by brand basis on a uh, on, uh, across a full range of brands. This data, th this research that we demonstrated today was for CPG brands, but through other single source measurement techniques, uh, uh, databases, you can, we, we can expand this and we plan on expanding it to non-CPG brands as well. Uh, but this is just a few brands. This is just the beginning of a process. We very much want to encourage that process on an industry-wide basis. And we've already taken, uh, a, 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 already a major step has been taken in that, uh, in that regard. Uh, the CRE uh, has undertaken through its return on investment uh, <coughs> committee uh, a major uh, effort uh, to measure all th to measure all things ROI and to come up with a best practices approach for ROI measurement. Uh, part of that is a uh, the part two where we, we've already presented and many of you have seen the results of stage one of that analysis, focusing on best practices and the issues in uh, in measuring ROI and in uh, bil building the media mix models and the marketing mix models of tomorrow. Uh, we have just been given the funding uh, for phase two, which will focus on the long-term advertising effects. So uh, Alice uh, Sylvester and Jim Spaeth of Sequent Partners are beginning work on phase two, uh, trying to expanding upon uh, hopefully what you consider to be the groundbreaking research that uh, we've provided today. Uh, and Nielsen, uh, through CRE, will be uh, funding that research and working with us on that exciting project. And I welcome all of you to participate because the important thing here is uh, to build uh, first a normative database about uh, across all categories and second uh, to, uh, to develop best practices in terms of what, uh, what actual marketing decisions and marketing uh, uh, applications uh, will allow advertisers to maximize the value of uh, the long-term effect relative to the short-term effects because we have, what we've seen is they can vary uh, substantially. Uh, and at CBS, we are also offering our advertiser partners uh, that have established long-term television advertising campaigns and I should add, we're also interested in doing this uh, in other media, uh, particularly radio, uh, including schedules on CBS. Uh, we're offering them the measurement of the long-term effects of, their of these campaigns, uh, utilizing the resources that you uh, saw employed today. Uh, we want to give our advertisers the specific answers regarding the true value of their, their, of their advertising campaigns while building a normative database to help all of our clients maximize the long-term brand equity benefit of effective television advertising. Thank you. <laughs>